<laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, so going back to Calc 1, how do we find candidates for maxima and minima? Set the derivative equal to zero critical points and endpoints. Endpoints, thank you. Okay, so those are the two things. In several dimensions, we have the same general philosophy. We look for places where the derivative is zero. Now that's a vector that has to be zero. Okay, that's how we find the interior candidates. The exterior ones, the ones in the boundary, are much harder. And today we have basically passed the buck on trying to solve those. We've done tricks and we've replaced these problems with calc one problems by substituting for variables. We have not solved it as a legitimate two, three, four dimensional problem. That's going to change today with Lagrange multiplies. So the goal of Lagrange multiplies is to handle constraints. So assume x lives on a surface given by g of x equals c. So, i.e., it's the set of all x such that g of x equals c. What does this remind you of? Where have we seen something like this before? Level sets. So this is the level set of the function g at height c at value c. Okay? Then the candidates for a max or minimum of f satisfy 1, g of x equals c, and 2, the gradient of f at x equals lambda times the gradient of g at x. Where lambda is a real number, and we'll assume the gradient of g is never the zero vector. And so this is the statement of Lagrange multipliers. Of these two conditions, one of these two conditions should be pretty obvious. Which one? Yes? Well, I don't understand. If we're talking about g of x, where does f come? We, the candidates for the candidates for maximum minimum of f. So I want to. So I assume that x lives on a surface given by g of x equals c. Right. So I'm saying to find candidates for the maximum minimum of f subject to x lives on the surface g of x equals c. Two things have to happen: g of x equals c, and the gradient of f is some multiple of the gradient of g. So I claim one of these two conditions. Once you unwind the definition, is pretty obvious that we must have. Which of these two conditions must we have? Which one, the first or the second? We, we have to have both of them, but which one, by definition, do we have to have? The first one. The first one. We're looking, we're telling you x lives on the surface g of x equals c. We want to find the candidates for the maximum minimum of f among all the x that live on the surface. So we have to remember g of x equals c. When people do Lagrange multiplies, this is one of the most forgotten points, is people forget to take into account that g of x equals c. Let's count variables. Let's count how many things are going on. So let's say, assume x is an rn. So assume x has n components. How many equations do we get from grad f equals lambda grad g? How many components does this have? So if we have n inputs, how many components will the gradient of f have? n. n. So we assume f, you know, grad f and grad g have n components. How many unknowns do we have in this problem? Number of unknowns is what? So we're trying to solve this system of equations. How many unknowns do we have? What are we trying to find? What are we looking for? We're looking for x. How many components does x have? 
So the unknowns is, we have n from x, we have anything else in here that we don't know. Lambda. So we have n plus 1 unknowns. And it's x1, x2, dot, 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 xn, and lambda. We have n plus 1 unknowns. This gives us n equations, and this gives us our n plus first equation. The number of equations is n plus 1 n from grad f equals lambda grad g, 1 from g of x equals c. So we do have n plus 1 equations and n plus 1 unknowns. Is there a chance to solve this? Yeah. We at least have as many equations as unknowns. There's a chance maybe we can solve for x1, solve for x2, solve for x2, keep going through. Is our goal to solve for all n plus 1 values? Is that what we're trying to do? Are we trying to find all n plus 1 values? No. What are we trying to find? X. X. So this is one of the situations where not all the unknowns are equal. OK? That's with an M&M, &M, absolutely. Right? We're allowed to discriminate. If you could only solve for n of the n plus 1 unknowns, if you had to give one of them the shaft, who would you shaft? Lambda. Lambda, right? Go for it. <laughs> I, lambda is not at the same level of importance as the x1 through xn. Now, in a lot of physics applications and a lot of economics applications, lambda has some meaning. There's some significance to the value of lambda. But if I'm trying to find what point gives me my candidate for maximum minima, lambda is just along for the ride. It's a helper variable. It's there to help us find the candidates. But at the end of the day, we don't care about lambda. OK? So again, there's a little bit of an asymmetry in what's going on. OK? So how much calculus is being done here? A lot or a little? Very little. We just take the derivative. How much algebra is being done? an enormous amount. So the great difficulty of Lagrange multiplies is actually solving the algebra. And in most situations, you can't solve the algebra exactly. Okay? What I want to do is I want to do a couple of special cases and give you a flavor of how we can solve this. Uh, I've go through in detail in the online video why this method works. I want to just quickly sketch why it's true. So sketch of why it works. Okay, so for something like this, why does Lagrange multiplies work? So imagine you have some surface. Here's my surface, g of x equals c. I apologize a little bit for the notation. People like to use c of t for the closed curve on a surface. So imagine you have some point here, x, and you have lots of different ways of staying on the surface. I could flow in this direction, I could flow in this direction, I can't come out of the board like this or I would leave the level set. So I let C of t be a curve in the surface. And let's let C of 0 be my key point x. And C prime of 0 will be v, which is tangent to s. Right? So I have some curve, and I stay in the curve for all of time. Okay? And now I know that at time zero, I'm at some point x, and my instantaneous direction of motion is some direction v. Okay? So, what can you tell me about g of c of t? What will be true about g of c of t? It equals c. Therefore, the, the derivative of g at any point t is equal to? <coughs> yes? V. Not b. So g of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I should be evaluating this at C of T, my, my, my fault. I just did one of the most common mistakes in the chain rule. I apologize. Mm -hmm. So the derivative of G evaluated at any point C of T would be? Okay, let's, 
let's let's expand this out. Let's let's call this function a of t. Let's write it really slowly. Let's call this function a of t. What's a prime of t? So a of t is always equal to c. A prime of t is what would a prime of t be? Zero. Zero. There's no change. Think of it this way. I stay 1,500 feet above sea level. How fast is my height changing? Zero. It's not changing. That's what it means to be at a constant height. So if I stay on this set of all points, if I stay on this level surface, that's you know c units above sea level, then I'm always going to be c units above sea level. It's really just unwinding the English of what we're saying. So I'm always at a certain height. Now hopefully you're beginning to see why we cared about level sets. You know, the sadistic professor was just a small part of it. You know, it's useful. We can now use this to prove Lagrange multipliers. How? We know another way to calculate the derivative of this function a of t. How else could we cover its derivative? How else could we calculate the derivative of a of t? So a of t is g of c of t. What method can we use? We could use the chain rule. So by the chain rule, we get dg at c of t times c prime of t equals 0. Is this 0 the number or 0 the vector? Number. 0 the number, right? It's, we've already calculated 0 the number here. This is telling me how much it's changing. Well, we now would get the derivative of g. This becomes the gradient of g. And when I take t equals 0 at the point x, dotted with v <coughs> equals 0. So this is interesting. It tells me if I'm at any point on my surface, any point on the level set, and I choose a curve that passes through that point and stays in the level set, then the gradient of g at x dotted with v is equal to zero. And this is true no matter what curve I take, as long as the curve stays in the surface. There's only one direction left for the gradient of g to point. Which way does the gradient of g point? So the gradient of, yes? The direction of gradient of g. So it points in the direction of greatest change of the surface, and so we have another word for that. So what's the word for something like that? There's a special name for this direction. So g is pointing in the normal direction. G is normal. Let's do an example. Let's let g of x, y, z be x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So somebody tell me what g of x, y, z equals 1 represents. What does this represent? So what kind of object would this be? Maybe the level set at 1. Okay, and so physically can you describe it? So x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. This is the unit sphere. This is about the level of my artistic appeal, uh, close. Okay? It's the level set of the function with value 1. It's a sphere of radius 1. The gradient of g at x, y, z is going to be 2x, 2y, 2z. So if you draw your sphere, if I take some point over here, <coughs> Here's the radius vector from the center to the point on the sphere. If this is the point x, y, z, I'm telling you that at this point, the gradient of g is equal to twice that. Maybe twice that's a little bit larger. Maybe I'll get to there. It's in the same direction as the radius, which for this problem is perpendicular to the surface. It's normal to the surface. Okay. This is just one example. You could do ellipse, you could do a hyperbola, you could do a paraboloid, you can do lots of different surfaces and see that the gradient of g points perpendicular to the surface. Another way to see this is if I look at different level sets. Here's maybe c equals 1. Maybe here's 
c equals 2, and so on and so on. Here's gradient of g. We know the gradient points in the direction of maximum change. If I stay along the level set, is my function g changing? G is telling me, the gradient of g is telling me which direction to go to see the greatest change. The gradient of g points normal to the surface. Okay? Another way to look at this is, you know, in general, if I have a full surface S, if I'm in n dimensional space, the surface will be n minus 1 dimensions. I have n minus 1 dimensions to go to travel. How many directions are left? One direction is left. That's the normal to the surface. So again, this is where linear algebra would be nice, but geometrically what's going on is the gradient points in the direction of maximum change. So if I force myself to stay on a surface, then whenever I'm moving, I have to be moving perpendicular to the gradient of g. So possible tangents, this would be a great possible tangent direction like that. Okay? So now we at least understand geometrically what the gradient of g means. Now the question is, why do Lagrange multipliers work? The next question will be, do they work well? You know, it's great that it gives us candidates, but if it gives us too many candidates, it's not going to be useful. So we've just seen that the gradient of g is pointing in the direction of greatest change of the level set. It's pointing in the normal. So why Lagrange works is the following. I'm going to just sketch the proof now. The full details are in the GLOW lecture. Imagine, you know, here's part of my surface. I'm over here. I'm at some point in the surface, and I'm trying to see, am I at a maximum or minimum? If I'm not at a maximum or a minimum, what must be true? I'm sorry? Well, we're now in a high dimensional space. All the points are endpoints. I'm on the boundary. So I'm on the boundary, I'm at g of x equals c, and I claim I'm not at a maximum or minimum. So if I'm not at a maximum or minimum, what must be true? So what must be true if I don't have a maximum or minimum of f right here? What happens if I move a little bit? You're going to increase or decrease. I'm going to increase or decrease. There's got to be at least one direction to move where I'm either increasing or decreasing. <coughs> okay. Do I actually have to have one direction where I'm increasing and one direction where I'm decreasing? Yes, because I said I'm not at a maximum or a minimum. So I've got to have at least one direction to go where I'm increasing, at least one direction to go where I'm decreasing. Okay. So now, let's choose a direction where I can move and my function will increase. Okay? There's got to be such a direction, or I'm at a maximum or minimum. So let's say the direction is this way. So I move in that direction. Okay? So, so far this seems pretty reasonable. If I'm not at a maximum or minimum, I've got to be increasing in one direction, decreasing in another. Just keep walking in one of those directions. Well, how do I figure out how my function is changing? I look at the gradient of f. So I need the gradient of f to have some component tangent to my level set. I have to have some component of the gradient of f in this direction. If the gradient of f was like this, the gradient of f has some component down here. So I'm going to draw a slightly larger version of this. So let's draw a bigger version. Okay. Here I am. Here's gradient of f. Here's the tangent. And this is going to be in the same direction right there as the normal to my surface. If the gradient of f has some component that's not in the direction of the gradient of g, I can move in that direction and see things larger. What direction would I move to see things smaller? So in this direction I see f increasing, what direction do I move to see f decreasing? The opposite direction. The opposite direction. So as long as the gradient of f is not aligned with gradient of g, I can move. I can change. So 
if ground f has a part in the direction of a vector tangent to s move in that direction or the opposite direction. And thus, these can never be maximum or minimum points. What's the only thing left? The normal. The normal thing. So, only possibilities left for max or min are where grad F <coughs> and grad G are in the same direction. Anybody fans of anybody who lives at 222 Baker Street? I hope I have the address right. What does he tell us? What's Sherlock Holmes' famous dictum? No, that's his uh, commentary. Actually, if you want a really good Sherlock Holmes movie, I suggest uh, watching Without a Clue, where it turns out Sherlock Holmes is a moron. He's a drunk, unemployed actor hired to distract everybody from Dr. Watson, who's the real genius. <laughs> Very funny film. What does Sherlock Holmes advise us in terms of finding things? Yes. Like you just have to look or something? Close. When you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the solution. Okay. Something along those lines. This is his famous <coughs> advice. Eliminate the things that can't be true. Whatever's left, <coughs> that's it. That's your answer. We have eliminated everything where the gradient of f is not in the direction of the gradient of g. The only thing that's left is when the gradient of f is in the direction of gradient of g. And then that has to be a set of candidates. Whether or not these candidates are actually maximum minima, that's another story. But these are the only things that are left. Now, why does this lead to gradient of f is lambda, gradient of g? Well, if two vectors are in the same direction, they're multiples of each other. So, grad f and grad g are multiples of each other. And this implies grad f equals lambda grad g. Okay. Now, of course, you should be a little bit surprised about why we're using lambda. Lambda is a Greek letter. Uh, lambda comes from what class? I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. No. Greek? <laughs> no. What class? <laughs> what class? <laughs> no, this is disgusting. I'm sorry? <laughs> linear algebra, of course, right? 90% oh. of the time, linear algebra is the right answer. You'll talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors in linear algebra. And that's really where lambda is coming from. So later today, I will try to show you some of the additional stuff. I'm not sure if we'll have time today. There's just you know, far too much to do with Lagrange multipliers. So this at least gives you some idea of why Lagrange multipliers works. All right. The difficulty now is doing the calculations. Any questions about the general theory? All right, so what I want to do now is I want to go back and I want to do some problems. I will keep that on the board to just you know, give us the guiding principle as to why things are true. And as an example, uh, let's go back and do the farmer ground problem. So example, farmer ground. All right. So we have the farmer ground problem. So given 40 meters of fence, maximize area of a rectangle. So the way we did this before, we did this as a one-dimensional problem. I want to do this now as a legitimate two-dimensional problem. Okay. So, how would we do, is, the, is this camera in focus? Uh, yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, no so, we have 40 meters of fence, maximum area of the rectangle. So, what's my constraint? G of x, y, What's my function going to be? X times y. 
Nope. X times Y is the function I'm trying to maximize. 2X plus 2Y equals 40. 2X plus 2Y equals 40. My function that I'm trying to maximize is what you just said, X times Y. Okay? So we get the gradient of G is going to be 2 comma 2. The gradient of F is going to be what? Yx. Yx. So now we need to solve grad f equals lambda grad g and g of x, y equals 40. So what do we get? We get y comma x equals lambda 2 comma 2 and we get 2x plus 2y equals 40. Alright, so we have three equations and three unknowns. So let's unwind. Equation 1, y equals 2 lambda. Equation 2, x equals 2 lambda. Equation 3, 2x plus 2y equals 40. There's a lot of ways to do the algebra. Looking at this, what's your first thought? Okay, so one possibility is you can solve for lambda. Yeah, we can get, well, okay, 2x would be 4 lambda, 2y would be 4 lambda, so we get 8 lambda equals 40, lambda equals 5. Uh, y equals x. 1 is y equals x. So how do you get y equals x? There's two ways to get it, one correct one incorrect. What's the correct way to get y equals x? So you, you must have seen something, you're saying y equals x. Um, y equals 2 lambda, x equals 2 lambda, so... So just straight substitution. Straight substitution, they both equal 2 lambda. The incorrect way to do it is to divide and say y over x equals 1, therefore y equals x. What's dangerous about going y over x equals 1, y equals x? Might be 0. Might be 0. So you always have to be careful about, have you divided by 0? And so if I divide, I have to say, or maybe x equals 0, or maybe lambda equals 0. Well, if x equals 0, lambda equals 0, y equals 0, impossible. So you can see very quickly, x equals 0 cannot happen. But you have to be careful about this case. So danger, you know, of, you know beware of zeros. Beware of zeros. So now that x equals y, we use 3, and well, it's a whole three. We use 3, and we find 2x plus 2x equals 40, therefore x equals 10, therefore y equals 10. What did we never find? Can we go back and find lambda now? Yes. Yes. Should we? No, we don't care about lambda, right? You know, we use lambda to get to x equals y. We use lambda to solve the problem. We don't care at the end of the day whether or not we know the value of lambda. Sometimes it is more convenient to solve for lambda first than to just directly solve for x and y. Okay. Any questions about this problem? So this is the prototypical example of how you do it. This is probably the easiest example I can give you because the algebra is very straightforward. The calculus is the same in all the cases. Start off by writing down your equation of constraint. Write down the function you want to maximize or minimize. Calculate the gradients. Set the gradients equal to each other. And don't forget that the equation of constraint must be satisfied as well. You need to do all of this stuff. Okay. Any questions on what we've done so far? Okay, what I want to do now is I want to do a slightly more involved example. Okay. So now, let's consider f of x, y. 
Okay. Let's take f of xy equals 3x plus 2y. Let's take g of xy equal 2x squared plus 3y squared equals 3. What kind of shape do we have? What kind of shape is this? <coughs> it's a what? Circle. Not a circle. A circle would be like 2x squared plus 2y squared plus 3. You're close. Ellipse. It's an ellipse. So I'm trying to maximize the function 3x plus 2y subject to being on a ellipse. Okay. Every circle is an ellipse. Not every ellipse is a circle. All right, so step one is the gradient of g is going to be 4x, 6y. The gradient of f is going to be 3, 2. So we have to solve grad f equals lambda grad g, g of xy equals 3. So this gives us 3, 2 equals lambda 4x, 6y, and then we get uh, 2x squared plus 3y squared equals 3. Alright, so again, we have three equations, three unknowns. So now let's unwind. We get 3 equals 4 lambda x, 2 equals 6 lambda y, 2x squared plus 3y squared equals 3. Okay. What would, what's your first thought? So again, there's lots of different ways to do the algebra. When I see this, my first thought is if I take the ratio of 1 to 2, I eliminate the lambda. That looks pretty good. What is the only danger in taking the ratio of 1 over 2? I could divide by 0. So if lambda equals 0, can this happen? No, because if lambda equals 0, I get 2 equals 0. All right, lambda can't be 0. Could y be 0? No. It would be the same. Ah, uh, good. If y equals 0, we would get 2 equals 0. Right? So these imply x, y, and lambda are not 0. So we can safely divide. Okay? So 1 divided by 2 gives me 3 halves is 4 sixes times x over lambda. So uh, 4 sixes is the same as 2 thirds. So I think we get 9y equals 4x. Okay? All right, that's not so bad. Now what do we do now that we know 9y equals 4x? Plug it in. Plug it in. So how should we plug it in? Yes? We solve for one. We solve for one in terms of the other. So this gives me y equals 4 ninths x. So we get 2x squared plus 3 times 4 ninths y squared equals 3. Isn't it 3 times 4 ninths x? I'm sorry? 3 times 4 ninths x squared. Oh, did I do things the wrong way? You just wrote y. No, yeah, you, you... Oh, sorry, yes. Sir. Thank you. Okay. So now at this point, it's very simple algebra. I'm going to get some constant times x squared. What's the constant? It's going to be 2 plus uh, 9 times 9 is 81, but I have a 3, so it's 27. Uh, 16. 2 plus 16 27 x squared equals 3. And at this point, I'm bored. Okay? Is it that bad to solve for something times x squared equals 3? No, I'll just collect the other. So this is going to be 27, 54, 54 plus 60. 54, 60, 70, I think like 70, 27s. You bring that over. X is going to be plus or minus. So you get two candidates for X. And then when you have those two candidates for X, you just check. What do you think will be true about those two candidates? Same 
I'm sorry? One's a max, one's a minimum. One's a max, one's a minimum. So, yields two candidates. You know, compute F at each. And in my notes, I believe I go through, no, but I actually don't even go through. I, I say, I ask you to check. Okay. Okay, so now, this isn't so bad. Okay. Any questions about how you do calculations like this? All that happens now is I can give you more and more complicated algebra to do. Okay. I'm not going to go through all the stuff. You should have read the notes. You should have watched the video about some more involved problems. You know, a really good problem is you have one person on one curve, another person on another curve. You want to figure out what's the closest point between the two curves. And so one way you can do that is you can fix a special point on one curve and then say on the second curve, so you know, here's curve one, here's curve two, I'll fix this point here, and then as a function of the coordinates of this point, I will find which point here is closest, and I'll get a distance. And then I vary this point, and then I will find the minimum distance. I've gone through that calculation in the notes for this lecture, you will see it's not a pleasant calculation to do. It's much better to try to look at maybe simultaneous constraints. So a lot of times in life, you have multiple constraints that must be satisfied at the same time. Okay? So for example, maybe you're trying to build a car. You want to minimize the cost, because maybe you only have a certain amount of material. You maybe have a bunch of other things as well. And you want to satisfy all of these constraints at the same time. What's going on here is we're looking at just one constraint. So the question is, what would happen with multiple constraints? And so I want to just briefly describe and state the theory for multiple constraints. I'm not going to prove it. I'm going to give a sketch as to why it's true. So Lagrange with many constraints. So now we have <coughs> G1 of x equals C1, GL of x equals CL then max or min candidates have the gradient of f equals lambda 1 gradient of g1 plus lambda l gradient of gl and g1 of x equals c1 gl of x equals cl. So it looks very similar to what we did in, what, in the case of one constraint. And if you play the game of how many variables do I have, how many equations do I have, if x has n components, I have l things here, I have n plus l variables, oh good, this gives me n equations, I have, n, I have l more from the constraints, I have n plus l equations, n plus l unknowns. n plus l equations and unknowns. There is a chance that this can be solved. Do you think this is as pleasant or less pleasant as the one constraint case? Less. Less. We have a lot more stuff to deal with. Okay. What's going on is some kind of generalization. If I have to be on all of these surfaces at the same time, the only possibility is the gradient of f must be in some kind of combination of the normals of all the different surfaces. I can't be traveling in certain tangent directions. Okay. It's a lot more complicated, it's a lot harder to visualize because I have several different things. I will give you a quick sketch of why this is true. Yeah. You are not responsible for this on an exam. I might just ask you, at most, uh, how would you handle several constraints? Or what is the key idea behind proving Lagrange multiplies for several constraints? You'd have to be able to give me a one or two line sentence describing the key idea. I will not make you do one of these problems. Because it's no longer testing you on calculus. It's testing you on algebra, which I'm assuming you're all experts at, so there's no reason to test you on. Okay? I only want to test you on calculus. So here's a sketch. Consider g of x equals g1 of x minus c1 squared plus gl of x 
minus Cl squared. Constraint is g of x equals c, let c equal 0. So if I tell you c equals 0, what must be true? So if, I, if I tell you c equals 0, what must be true? So what does it mean if this equation equals 0? What's the only way that equation... Yep. All yes. terms equal 0. All terms equal 0. Isn't this a nice, cute backdoor proof? I want each one of these to be satisfied. So the way I can get them to be satisfied is I look at the sum of the squares of the differences. And here's my constraint. And watch how easily it follows. Now look, the gradient of g, I can actually do things a little bit more generally. I can put in, um, it'll be useful to put in an a1 here plus an al here to give myself a little bit more freedom. I'll put in some parameters. The gradient of g is going to be a1 to g1 of x minus c1, gradient of g1 plus dot 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 plus al times 2, gl of x minus cl, gradient of gl. And the way you can see this is, if you want to take the gradient of g, take the partial with respect to x1. So now you take, it's a1, 2, derivative of this, oh, so 2 times this to the first power, then the derivative of this, which would be partial g1, partial x1. I strongly urge you to do this calculation carefully and slowly. This is a great way to review for the midterm on Friday. Make sure you can prove a statement like this. You know, we just add them piece by piece by piece. Well, now if you want the gradient of f to be a multiple of the gradient of g, these can just become my arbitrary constants. So grad f has to be lambda grad g. Because this is now Lagrange multiplies with one constraint. And so if you unwind, you get grad f is lambda a1 2 g1 of x minus c1. Close the bracket here, grab g1, plus blah, 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 blah. And here's my multiples. Here are my different coefficients. So again, I now have a more general linear combination. This becomes my lambda 1. Right. There is a mistake here. This is worth a homework exemption. Two problems. What do you know about lambda 1? What does lambda 1 equal? Or when you're solving Lagrange multiplies, what else must I be doing? I'm checking for 0, checking to see if things equal 0. Okay. So lambda 1 has to equal, lambda 1 probably, is lambda 1 equals 0? Okay, so, so why does lambda 1 equal 0? Because if the term up there equals 0, all you've done is move the squared down. Excellent. Right? This is 0. So I'm, my linear combination is going to be 0 times grad g1 plus 0 times grad g2 plus 0 times grad g3. That's not useful. So unfortunately, this idea completely breaks down. If this number were anything other than 0, I have slack with a1. I can make a1 be anything, and I'm okay. But because it equals 0, I'm in trouble. All right, so let's just prevent it from being 0. All we have to do is let c1 equal 1 over 10 to the 1, I'm putting a couple of zeros, factorial, <laughs> and put a factorial there. Okay? c is now what's known technically as damn small. Okay? <laughs> If this is not enough for you, don't put in two factorials. Actually, double factorial is smaller than factorial. Double factorial means every other one. So don't go overboard. Okay? <laughs> this is an extremely small number. Well, what if I take the level set where g of x equals c, where c is this extremely small number? Does this have to be zero? No. But it's got to be damn close to zero. 
so close, I really cannot see the difference between being on this level set and not. This number is now not necessarily zero. And I can now try to play some games like this and say, eh, it's, it's close to zero. So I can now maybe adjust with the A1 and play with things like this. This is not even close to a full vigorous proof, but hopefully it's enough of a sketch to give you a sense of what can be done with Lagrange multipliers. That you have several constraints, there is a way to develop the theory. This is an extremely powerful idea of looking at differences of squares. How many of you have heard of Richard Feynman, the famous Nobel laureate? So he reduced all of physics to one equation. So in Feynman's formulation of physics, all of physics comes down to solving the following equation. So U stands for the unworldliness of the universe. And what he basically did is he took every physics equation and he subtracted the right-hand side from the left-hand side squared and summed. So you get, you know, U equals F minus MA squared plus da 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 And then the only way that this can equal zero is if every physical law holds. So he's reduced all the physics to one equation. He goes on to talk about why this is a horrible idea. And you should not reduce physics to just one equation by doing something like this. Does this help you solve physics? No. No. Does it give you a better idea of why physics is true? No. Does it allow you to save chalk? Yes. Yes, okay, so there's, there's some benefits to this. But for the most part, this is bad. It's not a good idea to just have compact notation for the sake of having compact notation. If the notation can help, if the notation can elucidate, that's a good thing to do. In general, however, just hiding things is a bad idea. Okay? But there is a clever idea here. This idea of looking at uh, sums of squares of differences. And the only way that can be zero is if the individual terms are zero. That's really good. And what we're doing here is if we force this to be really small, we're either on the level set or we're very close to it. And then you can try to do some kind of limiting arguments. You know, maybe I miss each other of these by a very small amount. And again, if I move by just a little bit, the hope is by continuity I should be close to the optimal answer. Okay, so we have about two minutes left. What I'm not going to do is you know, start a new Lagrange multiply problem. There's an 11-page handout, uh, which if this is hard for you to read you know, on the camera, is available to be downloaded from the course homepage. It talks about the problem of, imagine there are three trouble spots in the world, and you have to decide where do you want to put your fleets, or where do you want to put your military bases to minimize distance to these three trouble spots. For those of you who do not care about military applications, imagine instead that you are Walmart and you have distribution centers, and you want to minimize your supply times to various places. And maybe these are three stores, and you want to figure out where should you locate your distribution center. Walmart was phenomenal at doing calculations a little bit better than other people in terms of where they should place their stores, how their stores should expand and build out. And this is one of the reasons why we talk about Walmart and not Kmart, which according to Rain Man, Thank you. All right. That is where the cultural extra <laughs> Okay. So, where do I put my stores to minimize... Where do I put my distribution center? Where do I put my military base to minimize time to the different locations? A lot of it comes down to the issue we had in the method of least squares. How do we measure distance? What is the easiest way to measure distance between two points? Square meter turn squared. Okay, so that you use Pythagoras, but we don't like square roots. So rather than mi minimizing distance, let's minimize distance squared. Now that's not necessarily the right thing to do, because that, again, is going to weight things. It'll make the calculations easier. The other difficulty is if you're minimizing distance squared, what is the shortest way to get from Boston to Beijing? Across. I'm sorry? Straight across the, straight through the Yeah, through, not across. Okay? You are not going to be deploying your forces or sending your trucks through the surface, through the center of the earth. But in terms of doing the mathematics, that's the easiest way to do it. So I actually go through five different models. Uh, some of them can be solved using Lagrange multipliers, some of them need linear algebra of how you would do a calculation like this. It's a really good way to see more algebra of problems like this done. And I will send an email later today about you know, the plan of attack for Wednesday. My feeling is that's a good day to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus because the day before a new exam is not the day to cover new material. Okay.